done that before. All right, we're in. Okay. So in terms, please jump in. You guys are experts, so correct me, especially when it comes to the HVAC at any time. So the way I understand the HVAC equipment, guys, we have heating. So I thought to pick up the article that talks about heating. Article uh, 424 talk about fixed electric heating. So that will relate to if you're doing electrical heating equipment, electrical heating as in the burning, you burn electricity to get heat, not gas, not natural gas. So Article 424 will be your baby if you're doing some heat. And if you're doing some, um, so that's the H, the V, the, um, the air conditioning, that will be Article 440. Any motor that has a compressor inside it, Article 440 is your baby when it comes to sizing everything, electrically speaking. And when it comes to the ventilation, um, that will be Article 430, which is motors, uh, fans and so forth, exhaust fans. So between the Article 440, Article 424, and Article 430, you covered almost um, all the HVAC power part. So I do have, um, and again, please jump in at any time. We have a chiller on this side. We do have uh, what I what I believe it's a rooftop unit, and uh, also crack units here that we use for um, for data centers. So I started by um, talk a little bit about refrigeration cycle, and you guys are very familiar. One of the one of the most confusing parts for me when I was uh, at L.R.B. Beckett, when we were sizing all these uh, cooling towers and all this stuff. So one time I went to a mechanical engineer, I sat with a mechanical engineer and said, explain to me how the interaction, the mechanical interaction between all these equipment. So if you guys don't have a chance, sit with one mechanical engineer if you don't understand it fully. And they still did it confused too. So the refrigeration cycle, guys, the reason why we care about refrigeration cycle, because the NEC code book, if you have a piece of equipment that has some type of a compressor on it, some type of a compressor in there that NEC code book treat this particular motor different than any other motor and separate and assign a standalone article for it which is article 440 uh, where the calculation slightly different not a whole lot different but slightly different that's why we kind of care about the refrigeration cycle as you guys know the refrigeration cycle is the process of removing heat from the room not adding cool to the building right I used to think when they add cool to the building I don't know if anyone of you confused the green ones but they remove the heat and that's how they cool the building by removing heat you will leave nothing but basically a lack of heat is the cooling system um, the process, so the, so the mechanical refrigeration, the process of elaboration. I have two pictures. The, all these guys are from mechanical equipment. There's, um, and please jump in at any time. There are two ways of um, cooling. You can use the air, they, they call it air cool or their water cool. Air cool or water cool. Air cool, very simple. If you have an air conditioning in your, at your house, that's what you're dealing with air cool. You cool um, the condenser. Uh, the condenser outside through the air big fat fan blowing air through the condenser removing that hot air that heat from the coil the condenser coil so that's on this side on this side that will be the cool the cool uh, water or water cool so what they do instead of using um uh, the air they use the water to carry the heat out of the building and take it all the way to so-called cooling tower and they and they cool the water outside to the cooling tower so i thought that's to the two common ways and please jump in at any time if i understand it wrong you guys are experts too um so that's i thought these are the most important things and it comes when with, with removing the heat from the building there's a few uh, component very important to understand and i thought i'm going to jump directly to this picture guys when it comes to this component um, because these are the major components of any cooling system, any cooling system to understand. This is very simple system. So the, um, call it refrigeration cycle. What we do to understand you have your evaporator, which is a coil. Um, where's my, I think I have, here's a coil, looks like this. Evaporator. So you have my evaporator coil that's inside your furnace. If the simple thing, if you have a furnace, the sim to understand the residential one. So that coil is inside your furnace. What you do, that's called the evaporator. That's the one that collects the heat from the place that you want to cool, like this room or the house, and take it all the way outside. That's a major component. So that's that guy's business is to collect the heat from the area that you need to cool. And then we have the, um, then we have the compressor. And the compressor, anybody remember the, the, from the engineers the thermodynamic equation the relationship between volume temperature and pressure yes <laughs> so i didn't do good in thermodynamics <laughs> so that relationship supposedly if you could if you 
if the pressure is explained to me, if help me guys, if I uh, if I explain it wrong here, you have relationship between temperature, pressure, and volume. If you increase the pressure and you contain and you keep the temperature, you, if you increase the pressure, like the uh, compressor will pressurize the refrigerant, increase the pressure, you increase the pressure, and you maintain the volume at, uh, constant. What happens is the temperature goes down. Am I right here, Dave? Is that how I explained to me 25 years ago? <laughs> So what they do is the compressor is there's is a special type of refrigerant. What they use is they increase the pressure through the compressor by increasing the pressure on that uh, refrigerant. The volume is constant because of the, 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 the container, the pressure container. So increase the pressure, you reduce the temperature and that's what you're looking for. So now we reduce our temperature here, increase, increase the temperature here. Pressure times volume equals the constant times temperature. So it's one on the left side. Goes up the right side. Don't the volume stays constant? And it's so, P times V equals the two constants times temperature. So if you raise pressure, the volume constant temperature has to go up. Increase the pressure, the, the temperature, temperature goes, up. goes up. So, um, which is why you have the condenser. We have the, the condenser here. So, what you, what you do is then the liquid right here, that liquid, the cold um, liquid comes in here with a very cold. Um, so, uh, now you. So you got the, the cold the liquid coming in here into the evaporator. When the evaporator, as a liquid, in a liquid format, it will gain the heat, pick up the heat, it changes its status from liquid into pressure, gas, low pressure. Then it get, it get pressurized here again with the compressor, goes into the condenser, remove all the heat that has been collected. Um, so that's how I, I personally understand it. So you collect the heat through the evaporator, the compressor will um, then the liquid change into low so-called low pressure uh, gas. Th then you pressurize that gas through the compressor, and 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 pass this um, high pressure gas through the evaporator. The evaporate what uh, the condenser. The condenser big fan sitting there blowing the air right through these coils. When the fan through the uh, goes through the coils, it it removes that heat that has been collected from the place that you need to cool all the way out. It change it into high pressure into from high pressure gas into liquid and it continue the whole cycle did they do it right uh, there regardless of the pressure and that so so that's the whole idea of, of, of refrigeration what's in it for us the question would be what's in it for us um there's also that um, um expansion valve i have a couple of examples for it to control the flow of liquid inside the evaporator now you can put all these pieces, you can put the evaporator, the compressor and the condenser in one unit, or you can have a split unit. And that's why I get personally confused. I don't know if you guys also get confused. They put them all in one unit, it becomes evaporator, compressor and condenser in one unit, and they make a, a window air conditioning. That's what you have in the window air conditioning for the most part. Then they split them into pieces. Is that what you have a central air in your house? They have the, the evaporator inside your furnace with a big blower blowing at it. And they have the compressor and the condenser outside, and that will be the splitting the evaporator from the you know, from the condenser and the compressor. And they they have a lot of combination of the two. So um, so here's your evaporator. Um, it looks like these these uh, thin tube coils and a blower. What you do is you you move that refrigerant, cold refrigerant inside it. And when you have a blower blowing right through these coils, mechanical coils, you get from the other side, what do you get? You get cold, cold air. Uh, remove the heat from the interior. The job of that boy is to remove the heat. Compressor, they call them hermet hermetically sealed and direct driven compressors. I'll show you a picture of that one. It draws and boosts the pressure of refrigerant gas. You're right, boost the pressure instead of reducing the pressure uh, of the refrigerant gas. So they increase the pressure. Um, um, as well as draw the gas out from the evaporator into the uh, condenser. And the condenser, air cooled, water cooled, or evaporator cooled unit, that's where the condenser is the kind of the cool stuff. You can either air cool it by throwing in the outside unit, you have big fan throwing the air at it and removing the heat from it, or you can throw water uh, at it too. Uh, remove heat uh, that have been taken from the evaporator out. Expansion valve controls rate at which the liquid flows into the evaporator. So that's the whole cycle going um, get you the refrigeration cycle. That could be your big refrigerator or you could be your chiller or your or your air conditioning and so forth. Any comments, any correction guys about refrigeration cycle? I thought uh, coming from an electrical engineer, <laughs>
um, the most important thing because before you understand it, it's really nice for us. We are not mechanical engineers, obviously. We don't, you, you guys, we, we don't get involved in sizing the cooling system, um, electri electricals as electricals, but it's nice to understand how the components work and so forth. Any comments, guys, about evaporator, condenser, as well as the compressor relationship with the valve? Remove the heat from the place, throw it outside, either throwing, get rid of it through a fan outside or through a, a cooling tower. So that's my um, my components of refrigerant cycle. When I told them, I thought I have a list of them. Then we have uh, the reason why uh, hermetic compressors, they call them hermetic compressors. The compressor is a motor. So the, the difference between why would the NDC code book assign a whole article for it instead of going to 430? Last week, guys, we did 430. We did calculation for 40 in color D, right? Why would the NDC code book consider it a special? Here's a couple of cut sheets. The way I understand it, so it's, it's a motor compressor completely sealed into um, gas, um, gas tight steel casing. What they do is um, the refrigerant gas, at least for the uh, hermetic uh, compressors, they pass that gas over the motors. And then when I do when I do electricity, I always say enemy number one of electrical system is heat. If you can remove heat, you can make make a conductor number fourteen carry thirty amps. If you can, if you don't care about smoke, smoking the conductor or or burning it number one, or if you can remove the heat. So if you can remove the heat out of this motor, you can abuse this motor and make it work harder. And by by putting that refrigerant goes over the bearing and as well as over the winding and so forth in this combination they make this motor work much harder than any other motor and that's why the ndc acknowledged that and helped me david and everybody else guys they acknowledge that these type of motors are special and they we're going to assign an, a whole article about them article 430. any comments about that dave everybody else about the, this why it's special you know because the, that coolant actually helps cool the motor itself so we have refrigerant gases circulated through the compressor and over motor windings, rotor bearings, and shaft to cool the motor. If you cool it, what do you do? You can abuse it, so it can work harder. You can uh, so it it's a spe it becomes uh, different than a fan inside an air handling unit or a fan an exhaust fan on the roof by itself. The, so the the refrigeration cycle will affect the performance of the motor uh, compressor. Any comments, guys, about the hermetic? Uh, compressors so we got that one we got the refrigeration cycle um, somehow uh, okay we got the this is my refrigeration cycle we got the liquid moving in between here's a bigger system cooling system and you guys gonna help me um, so here's if the easiest ways to compare that's that's inside your house everything here is outside your house so here's my evaporator here now this one is air cooled. You can see we're throwing air outside to remove the heat from the condenser, right? Throwing big fans, throwing the air. That one is um, liquid cooled. So what they do, and, and please jump in here, help me too. In um, inside the evaporator, the chiller, they circulate the chill water instead of chill um, refrigerant. They chill the water and they circulate the water to the air handling unit or units in different locations. So now we're chilling water and circulating that water across to multiple locations inside the building. When it reaches the air handling unit coils, the, the, um, um, the cold coils or the cooling coils, goes through it, a big fan throwing right through it in the, in the air handling unit, and that's how you get that cooling, so-called cooling loads. So you have a chilled water pumps that circulate. Now you have a huge amount of you need pump to circulate that chilled water that that have been inside the compressor here inside the chiller um and it, and it circulate all the way to uh, cooling loads that would be the air handling unit where the coil the cooling coil inside the air handling unit. that's the 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 chilled water um uh, cycle then you have the condenser water cycle then you uh, am i so the other the other cycle um it takes here's where the water is the other cycle let me go back it you remove the heat from the evaporator and take it all the way to the condenser and to the cooling tower there's a couple of um condenser water so you're circulating another two aren't there two the way i understand it please help me here 
they are two separate, unique piping systems, separate completely from each other. One is the chiller, uh, chilled water, and the other one is the condenser, uh, con, uh, condenser water. So it takes all these pipes from the condenser all the way to the cooling tower. There is some heat load. You can recover some of these heats. That's in terms of uh, um, heat recovery. Use this heat into heating the, the domestic water inside your building. Um, heat exchange here and a couple of cooling tower pumps. So you take the hot water here to the compressor, you pressurize it, and you take it all the way to the cooling tower. In the cooling tower, big fans are throwing the air at it, removing the heat from it. It circulates back through the pump, it can by itself. Yeah? So you have to pump it back into the compressor. And the, right in here, removes the heat directly again from that cycle, Rem remove the heat from the evaporator and take it all the way out. Can anybody else jump in and, and, and chime? <laughs> Dave, anybody else in terms of removing the heat? So what they're doing, they're using the water to circulate, to send the chilled water to the, um, instead of refrigerant. They're using the water to go to the air handling units um, to cool the building. And also they're using water to go take the heat out from the evaporator or chiller all the way back into the cooling tower, which is typically on the roof and removing the heat through two um, separate cycles of water side by side to to pick up the heat. Um, any comments, guys, any questions about that? That's as good as it gets from, why didn't you guys bring the mechanical engineers here? As good as it gets from an electrical engineer. <laughs> David, any? So next you're gonna tell us about absorption chillers? Absor uh, I never really did understand those. Absorption chillers, <laughs> do you guys use absorption chillers? Yeah, we have. We have a few of them, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Instead of instead of instead of burning electricity, we burn gas, and we got cold from the other side. I have I I I don't want to go deep because I really did, personally I don't understand it a whole lot. But I do have a couple of anybody interested when I was researching that one for um, a couple of uh, projects. I have a, a a nice article about how that whole system works. Any comments, but these are, do you guys use a lot? Isn't that the most common? I thought chilled water is the most common one. Do you use a lot of absorption chillers? No, well, the well, there's, yeah. you know, the variable refrigerant flow is getting to be common now where instead of pumping chilled water, you're pumping a refrigerant around to the exchangers, which is, we've got four or five dollars from refrigerant. Yeah. That's the new. Uh, that's the new trend. So, so instead of chilled water, refrigerant that goes all the way to the air handling unit, or different. Well, it's heat exchangers. Okay. Heat pumps. Rather. Heat, heat pumps. pumps. Heat pumps. Okay, so that's basically the the <laughs> the major part. What I um what I thought electrically speaking, guys, is to be aware of is the cooling tower. There's multiple fans that we need to power here. Um, we do also the condenser um, as well as the evaporator, as well as the air handling unit here and the pumps. All these are electrical load that need to be picked and, and, and powered. So the, the, the closest that I got when dealing with mechanical equipment, guys, like you guys always do, you sit with the mechanical engineers and you identify the point of reference. Here's all the loads that we need to pick up, uh, including the control and, um, and they have the last say in terms of what equipment they have. We have to work with with, uh, with their equipment. So any question, any question guys about the cooling system, cold cooling system instead of, this is the water cooling system instead of air cooling system, like we did. I thought that's a nice um, cycle. If I did not explain it right, stop by one of your mechanical engineers and they'll, they'll explain it to you. I grabbed this one from one of my um, colleagues, the mechanical designer, and I thought, um, <clears throat> and we highlighted it, I use it in my class. So, this is the same system, except everything highlighted here is electrical component that need our attention. Electrical component that need our attention. So you can see, here's the chiller right here. Here's my condenser. Basically, what you're looking at is this system in, this, in a different schematics. So I have, um, I have in, also the, the, I have my boiler here there because it's a heat pool. So what I would do, I have my, um, in this area here, I have what, what we call it, let's start with this. I have my chiller, so I chilled the water in here. 
and I have the condenser, so I take that this is cycle, the first cycle of water, the second cycle of water, the condenser take the heat from the chiller, take it all the way to my cooling tower. So a couple of things we have to pay attention here. We have a couple of pumps. These are all uh, um, identified. Everything colored in yellow and the other color have to be powered by us. So you go to the cooling tower. I have one or multiple fans I have to take care of. I have also right here a fan that I have to bring the water from the cooling tower back into my condenser. I do have my uh, 19 and um, my 17, I believe, is we have um, we have pumps, circulating pump, chilled water circulating pumps. I do have the chiller itself that needs some attention of power in terms of power. I do have, then I get into the um, my um, air handling unit. This is my air handling unit. Inside the air handling unit, you have a cooling coil, a cooling coil as well as what looks like we have also a heating coil, two coils. One heating coil coming out of uh, burning uh, gas, not electrical, we're burning gas to heat the building. And we're bringing the, um, the hot water into the, uh, the um, what do you call this, the air handling unit right here as a coil. So I need to pay attention to this pump that pumps the water from the boiler all the way to the coil inside the, the air handling unit. I need to power that one. I need also some type of a control circuit and power circuit to control and power that boiler, the gas boiler. It's not an electrical boiler. It could be electrical boiler too. Inside the air handling unit. Then I have the fans, these big fans sitting inside the air handling unit and throwing air into multiple coils. If it throw the, it throw the air into the hot coil, it gets heat from this side. If throw it in the cold coil, it gets cold from the other side. I'm simplifying that here. And then there are a couple of dampers here that you have to pay attention and here heat, heat um, air exchange between the outside and recycling and so forth. A couple of dampers that we either have to power them or have to be aware that the mechanical contractors have to pick these as part of their control or power points that they have to um, to deal with. And so that's basically what, what we have. A couple of dampers here that we can control. You can control the... I, I hate to go there, there because I'm not really qualified to talk about cooling control. You can control the system by the cooling by controlling the flow of fluid flow, chilled water, hot water flow, and, and or you can control it through the air handling unit, the fans in the air handling unit, and or you can control it through the dampers that they have. So there's this is their way of controlling using Johnson control to control the, the heat and the cool inside the room like this. So I thought this um, these are highlighted in this uh, complicated system condenser. It highlighted the electrical component that we should be aware of, at least powering or controlling in conjunction with our mechanical counterparts. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? Is that everybody? Is that what you guys do at work? Most of the part, you get this information from the mechanical or you just get a schedule. Do you sit and do that? We'll get both. We'll get both? Okay. Ideally. Okay. Okay. And then, and this is meant for explanation too. I really, we, I mean, um, you don't, we, we don't have to go deep into all this stuff, but it's really nice to know where the points of connection. Because when it comes to electrical and mechanical, we overlap a lot in a lot of areas. And it's really nice to know where the electrical contractor responsibility stops versus the mechanical contractor, as well as the engineering side of it. You guys are in-house, so you don't fight a lot. But in the field, the mechanical electrical contractors, they have to be to coordinate where, who's going to be pulling the EMT conduits to this uh, class 2 circuit that's going to be controlling this number. Um, you know, who's going to put the conduits, who's going to put the wire, who's going to wire it, who's going to install it, and so forth. My well, understanding... I like it and appreciate it because if we look at it, if we understand something like this, then when mechanical says they have this air handler and they have a boiler and a chiller, you could say, okay, where are the pumps? Yeah. Chad said they're supposed to be pumps. Where are the pumps and how big are they? Oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, the old, probably the only major component you're missing is a return fan. Is it? Okay. The air handler could have a supply and return yeah. and exhaust fan for that. They've got three fans instead of one. But the one fan he shows there could be three fans, but I think it's good because you could, you know, dampers, okay. They're always missing the dampers. They, they seldom tell us about the dampers, right? So if you have a diagram like this, you can say, okay, he told me about the fans and the pumps. Now, what about the dampers? You might put the control rolls or power on 
And if uh, I know, I don't, we did the two pages. If it's too close to read, I can, this is just a PDF file. I can email the PDF if it helps, You're especially good. the highlight if, as a standalone picture like this, if it's, if it's stuff. So, but you can, you can also use it. Any comments guys about how the system is put together? So I thought just to throw how the mechanical system is put together. It helped me as an electrical engineer understand how the system is put together when I power. It really does. So when it comes to this, then uh, each one of these mechanical equipment, you're going to ask yourself when you look at it first, number one, I need to power it. So I need a circuit breaker and a cable um, and a feeder to it. Number one, powering it. Number two, I need to disconnect it if it's a motor. So I have to provide a disconnect with inside to the piece of equipment so I can disconnect it. And number three, I need to control it maybe with these maybe because the control a lot of these controls done mechanically so you're going to power it you're going to disconnect it and you're going to control it each one of these um you're going to ask yourself do i have a, a feeder to power it with an over competition device for it and do i have a disconnect for it and am i involved in the control process for this uh, for this piece of for this item inside this cooling heating system comments guys about this so i thought that uh, helped now this is born from a real project i I, I'm from an engineering firm that has been done. You guys have done many of these. Um, so chilled water piping system, as well as condenser piping system. And it shows, um, and I can't say the project because it's really borrowed in a real project. We have, um, but I, I thought it's really nice when the mechanical guys come and put all these chillers, we have one, two, three, four, five chillers side by side parallel. When we talk about paralleling next week, uh, I'm going to be talking about generators and paralleling generators. That's exactly what they're doing in order because the load is too big to chill in one chiller. They parallel their chillers like we parallel our generators and transformers. So they're paralleling all their chillers here from one side and they're throwing them all the way to all these cool um, cooling loads, which I believe these are the coils inside the air handling unit. One, two, three, four. And there's a heat exchange here. Um, and so this the chilled water is going right into the air handling unit. Big blowers blowing air right through that chilled water coil. Um, all these four air handling units from the other end, you get yourself chilled uh, water that you can control either by the flow of the chilled water or by the speed of the fans in the air handling unit or by the dampers inside um, the duct system that they have or inside the, the, um, inside the, the, the air handling unit. Any comments, guys, about these chiller? This is chilled water taking it all the way. So one, two, three, four, these will be inside your hospital or sport arena located like we locate our, our panels and uh, switch gear, switchboard strategically inside the building so we can reduce the voltage drop. The same thing I assume they do, the, they locate them in different areas. Any comments about the chilled water? So the top part, the top part here is actually equivalent and help me here the equivalent to this the evaporator and the coolant that part any comments guys about that so the bottom the bottom here the evaporator and the cooler is equivalent in this to the chilled water into my chilled water now we chilled the water we took the heat out of the building through four air handling units and five chillers and these chillers don't have to be like we do generators um, um, we can parallel generators, so one of them might be, or two might be for redundancy, like we do our generators, so it doesn't have to be all running at the same time. I want to bring to your attention all these chilled water pumps that they have to pump the water. The water doesn't flow by itself, so you have to pump that chilled water all the way into the chiller, chill it, and take it back again to the air handling unit to remove, uh, remove the heat. So that's a chilled water cycle. Right underneath it is so-called condenser water piping system. Now, from the other side of the same chiller, the other side of the same chiller, you take another set of pipes and you take um, and remove the heat that you recovered right in, you brought, brought it right here from the air handling unit, this hot inside the chiller, it gets removed through this other cycle, that, that cycle here, and taken all the way into uh, cooling towers, another five cooling towers sitting in here. Um, with a lot of air tank separation, don't ask me about the whole system, how they balance their system. But what I'm interested in, all these um, five chillers at the bottom, all these five cooling towers at the top, each and every one of them need a substantial amount of power. 
circuit breaker to power as a, a conductor um, or a feeder to uh, control it and it is connected to disconnect it. Plus, we have to talk a little bit talk about what type of, uh, are they going to uh, provide the VFDs on these chillers or are we providing the VFDs? Typically, they do. And all, all these cooling um, cooling towers, fans in these cooling towers, are we providing the control system to them as in VFDs typically or are they providing the v VFDs to control all these big fans that are blowing air onto these coils that's full of hot water and throwing it into Mother Earth. So any comments, guys, about these? Look at all these pumps. Each and every one of these pumps require you to provide a feeder for these systems. So I have five pumps at the bottom, five chillers, five cooling towers, and four air handling units um, with all the associated pumps with them. Yes. I'm sure they do, yeah. Okay, so instead of having a third chiller, they chill the water, store it in a big tank, retrieve it when needed. But in this case, if it's a tank other than pumps, we, there is our interface, electrically speaking, other than pumping it there, yeah. Connecting to another chiller. Okay. Any comments, guys, about this one? So this is coming from a project. Um, so that's my uh, chilled water pipe and condenser water piping system that we need. And I thought from the same project, these are also coming from the same project, guys, that make the electrical... Um, the cut sheets or the mechanical information. So I'm gonna, um, so I starting with that one, here's my pumps. This is chilled water and condenser water pumps. Um, my chilled water pumps, my, uh, my uh, right in here, you can see the condenser water. The most important thing about these um, is really electrically speaking is right here, the horsepower, 100 horse. So all these are pumps. So there's, when we size for pumps, we care less about Article 440, so we don't go to Article 440 all the other. We use 430, and we did what we what I gave you guys the sheet that we did last week. So we treat it like any other motor. They're pumps. So I have the voltage is 483 phase system, and it has a VFD specified that's going to be driving that pump. And you can see all these electrical information here. Anybody knows what the BHP? I was struggling with that one. Brake horsepower. Brake horsepower. So, but we size based on the HP horsepower. Brake horsepower is the horsepower they actually need. To help the function, then they are supposed to pick the next largest motor that will provide them that break horse. Okay, okay, that makes a lot. So this is uh, the horse bar, mechanical horse bar, and then we go to the next standard. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. So we go by the horsepower. You can see this is 100 horsepower for 83 phase, 60 hertz. The speed, we care too much. We don't care a whole lot, 1770, and it has a VFD on it. And you can go all the way through each and every one of these chilled water pumps and condenser water pumps. So you are supposed to talk to your counterparts, the mechanical. If you don't see these pumps, where are the pumps? Especially if they were green designers, like I used to be at one time, and um, or engineers, and, um, and they missed something. Any comments, guys, about these pumps? That's all pumps. When we size these pumps, you don't go to Article 430, 440, you go to Article 430 and treat them like any other motor. They're just nothing but motors. So that's the first list. Do I have, uh, I don't think I have 480. I have a 120, it looks like there's um, a pump right in here. Um, a 120 pump. So pay attention to the voltage. What I usually pay attention to the, the horsepower, the voltage, and what type of control do they have. The rest, I don't know, Dave and everybody else, do you guys use the mechanical info here? I mean, it's, I'm sure it means a lot to our counterparts, the mechanical guys, um, but for us, not a whole lot. Then I have another slide from the same project that you're looking at for chillers as well as cooling towers. So my chillers are really interesting animals here. They're giving me the evaporator and the condenser inside my chiller. Um, my condenser, my evaporator, right inside my chiller. Of course, the evaporator um, will be part of the chilled water, and that will, will be part of the uh, condenser water cycle. I don't know if you guys pay a lot of attention to all these uh, speed of water movement and all this good stuff. Three chillers, um, they have a VFD, no VFDs on each one of them. This one has a VFD. Look at the voltage. Um, there's a voltage 4160. Two of them are actually medium voltage, so-called medium voltage, so they're 5K. Five kilovolt, um, and one of them is um, 
as uh, 460. And we have uh, the KW is the most important things. I have my size that I'm going to be sizing my equipment based on is 894.0 and the full load amp. The rated, this is so-called rated load amps. When I did the calculation for you guys, you see the word rated load amps or rated load current. This 140, 140 and 375, these are um, a rated load amps. I did not size the medium voltage part of it, but it's really sizing a medium voltage would um, would be the exact like like low voltage. You take it continuous load multiplied by 1.25 and size your cable, except instead of going to 310.15 B16, you're going to go to the tables at the end for the medium voltage. You're going to be using medium voltage cable when you do it. Any comments, guys, about the chiller? So what we care, electrically speaking, electrically speaking, what we care is really um, about the sizes all these electrical sizes right in here we need to know what the voltage so we need assign a voltage system and also this is really nice when we do coordination and overcome to be nice to know what type of uh, starter are they starting them across the line which is almost always none heard of they don't or are they using a uh, variable speed drive or soft start on them or are they using a y delta a lot of them run on delta the chillers but they start them as a y and run them as a delta to get the full oomph out of these chillers any comments guys about these Yes, sir. These are manufactured. These are manufactured. That's, yeah. that's called that's rated that's load app. Yeah. You need. So what I uh, good point. What I uh, what I normally do is I take this. Let's just say one of size uh, this one. I'll take the 370, uh, 375 amps, and if I want to uh, size my service, I multiply this one by the voltage rated voltage, which is um, well, I I always use 480. I don't like to use 460 and multiply it by one point. I know a lot. Some people use 1.460. Then multiply it by 1.7. Three and that will be the allocated volt amp when you do your service uh, calculation or your MCC calculation and so forth for that piece of equipment. That's sizing the service. When you size the feeders for it, I have an example. You take the rated load amps, and I do have two examples, guys, for you on the sheet. You just multiply by 1.25 to size the um, to size the uh, feeders. But the manufacturers of these equipments, they also later on will talk about giving you a minimum circuit ambicity that you have to use anyway. It's already done for you. So then your cooling tower. So really for everything that we've done today, nothing. The only new stuff is just the chillers. The cooling tower as well as the pumps, they're all motor loads. And what we have done last week in terms of the sheet that I shared with you guys applies to the cooling tower as well as the as well as the air handling unit, as well as the pumps in between, because they're all motors. So the special part is really the chillers here. So if you look at the cooling towers, I have my cooling towers, a bunch of um, cooling tower fans to blow the air. And it looks like I, uh, where's my horsepower? Uh, horsepower high, I might have fan, electrical, all of them. Uh, inlet, it looks like I have my um, RPM. This is my horsepower. So I, I there's my horsepower right here, 50. Uh, this is the quantity care less about the speed a whole lot. I care about the voltage too, and I do care about what type of um, of uh, control they have. So they have a VFD on it on a 480 uh, 50 horsepower motor. Am I missing anything on these? These are the electrical com the electrical information that we need to know in order. Now that's all what I need. Then you go to the NDC 430, and from there you size the disconnect if it's not provided by the manufacturer. Then you size the feeder, you size the overcome tension device, you size the conductor, and and um, the overload if the overload if it's not provided by the manufacturer. The controller looks like the VFT is provided by the manufacturer, so you don't have to worry about the the overload and the controller looks like it's the manufacturer will provide that one. Any comments, guys, about cooling towers? 
do we do you guys typically provide the controller for the cooling tower fans david or they come with them typically not on a cooling tower they what typically not on a cooling tower not on the cooling tower okay. so in this case in this case i need to be aware that i have um i have one two three four four big fans sitting one for each it looks like one for each one of these cooling towers and the other one probably redundancy um it could be one fan or multiple fans um, some of them have multiple fans or rated together and you provide a feeder for them any comments guys about these any comments so that's what i thought just this will build the whole system together and get you with the electrical component that you need to worry about and you pick in terms of sizing. So article, so um, for this, this will be your article 430. You apply article 430. This is the only place that you apply article 440 and these all these calculations. And of course, the one above it here is also article 430. So that's not article 440. They are all pumps, pumps and fans. Okay. Then I uh, went into something controlled. This is very simple control system, guys. Um, for um, an AC unit, a three-phase um, an AC unit with a compressor. I don't know how, how clear is that one. So I have my controller, my thermostat in here. These wires are so-called class two circuit. This is my class two circuit that. Um, I believe the mechanical contractors will be picking up, but you have to ask about these. These are going to your thermostat, class two circuit thermostat wire going between your thermostat as well as your uh, compressor. This this happened to be um, the compressor. This is, um, what do we call it now? The condenser and the compressor unit, the outside unit. Think of it like your house, the condenser, the outside unit, except it three phase. So this has the condenser as well as the compressor right in here. And the heating um, the heating load is coming out of here. So you have your boiler here, um, your boiler coming in here. So that's also a class two circuit that you're going uh, to pick up the, um, uh, the, the control circuit from your boiler. So that's in terms of control, that's the only thing we really have to worry about control wise. Power, we already did, did the power. Power, this looks like a compressor that runs a three phase compressor. So I need to size my uh, feeders. I need to size my disconnect right here, my overcome detection device. Um, everything internally, everything that you're looking at here is actually internal to the piece of equipment. Really, we don't worry too much about them. Um, I, don't, I want to bring to your attention a couple of very important things. This is high pressure, low pressure. Instead of turning your compressor into a bomb or sucking the air in out or blowing it up. So they have a couple of high pressure uh, control system, a couple of temperature control system and overload, a couple of con controls here that when you turn on and off, you have to turn the um, compressor fan as well as the, the fan as well as the compressor themselves. So, and there's also, I don't know if you guys can see, there's a little transformer here that takes the power inside the compressor here, takes the power from say 480 into a 120. In, in this case, probably most likely it will take the power from whatever voltage into a 24 volt, um, 24 volt right in here. So you can land this one across your thermostat. So what's in it for us? You need to be aware that there has to be a class two, article 725. Class 2, guys, I don't know how many of you have used Article um, 725 in any code book. Talk about Class 2 circuits. Oops, 25. The most important thing about these Class 2 circuit control circuit, they shall not be, like you all probably know, they shall not be installed in the same conduit or box with anything other than Class 2 and Class 3 circuit. So if you were to pipe them, the electrician in the field to have to pipe them, they have to pipe them separate pipe for them. Um, they can't put them, with some exceptions, you can't put them into with the power circuit inside the pipe. You can attach the wire to the pipe if it's functionally associated, if it's going to the same machine like this, attach it to the outside of the pipe, but you cannot put it inside the pipe. Typically, we pipe them separately, the control and the power. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? Any comments? Any questions? So... So since this is outside, they also, I don't know if you guys can see, there's a cabinet heater inside it here um, and a bunch of other things. It's a whole big unit. And that's why when on the nameplate, you're going to find something called um, rated load amp for the whole equipment. And they give you a one big rated load amp. 
because I have heaters, I have pumps, I have um, um, a lot of control coils. So it's not just one big, that's why it's special. It's not just fan, big fan, a motor. There's a whole lot of things inside this box that's called the AC unit, the condenser and, um, and the compressor. And the other coil, you might wonder where's the, um, Where's my evaporator? My evaporator will probably will be somewhere here and pipe together with its own fan blower that's coming. So you have to also worry. So that's just showing this one, showing the compressor and the condenser, the outside unit, as well as the controller. I picked it because of the controller, really. The evaporator in this example will be located inside the building and it needs to be powered either through a, um, it'll be, the, the fan has to be powered. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? Comments about turning into schematics? So, okay, so that's uh, some of the control. These are cool system control, guys. Um, again, I'm, I'm not the most expert on that one, but Johnson control um, and a bunch of other, I don't know what type of control you guys use, but uh, their control is really very it's sophisticated, special. It's uh, manufacturer related. Um, so they can control all the flow of these uh, these chillers. Okay, then I'm uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cooling system, guys. They have a so-called split package and split system package. I mean, single package cooling unit and split package system. So, and that's where it gets confusing um, a little bit how they package them together. If you if you think the way I think about it, I, I need to know where the evaporator is located, where the condenser and where the compressor are located. So these equipment, they can package them all in one, throw it in the wall, and you got yourself a unit, a wall unit, or you can separate them um, in any way, shape, or form. So typically, if they put um, if they, a single unit, if you put a, a one on the roof like single unit here, that would be all the coils, the evaporator in this case the condenser, the compressor, and sometimes they even have a, cool, a heating coil inside this unit and throw in the, and, and everything is in this basically big unit. Or they can split them, they can split, they put one part in here, inside, and another part in, outside, and that will be, um, that will be your condenser and your, um, your compressor above on the roof as well as the evaporator inside the building. And I think that's similar to this is similar to what we have in residential, where you have the evaporator inside the furnace, this coil, if you ever open the, coil, the, the furnace, and the compressor, as well as the condenser outside the unit. You guys use a lot of split system and packaged and all this good stuff. Um, so that's, then we get into the rooftop units. Rooftop units, um, um, rooftop units, so, um, so I don't know, I want to highlight a few things in it. Here's my condenser fans. So my condenser, here's my condenser. So definitely we have our condenser here. Um, condenser and condenser fans. I do have my compressor here. So I have my condenser, uh, my compressor, and my compressor fan is there. I And then I have, um, then I believe they have the, the cooling coil in here. So it's all one standalone package. Here's my cooling coil. And here's a big supply fan that, that shoot the air through it. So all in one big unit, um, it's all packaged together. Am I right in, in that one? So we have my cooling, my cooling coil, my fans that blow. So I have my cooling coil, um, and then either, then basically you throw out of this rooftop units um, hole there, and then you can circulate inside your building. Do they put them where they remove the coil, um, Dave, from that one, and they put it somewhere else in air handling unit too? Do they still call them rooftop units? That's why I get, get mixed up when they remove the coil, that cooling coil, and put it in an air handling unit. Um, I believe that becomes a condensing unit. I don't know. I'm not. Anybody can chime into that one. But if you have the cooling coil, the condenser, the condenser fan, the blower right here, all in one big package, that's your rooftop unit. Yes, anybody? For the most part, yeah. So it's um, all in one, and all what comes out of this unit, basically, they can also have a, a heating unit, a heating coil in here, my understanding, and and heat the building to this. So all what comes out of it is cold air, out of this unit that you can circulate inside the building through multiple through ducts. 
that's your rooftop unit. Um, then the condensing unit, I don't think I have a system for a, a con so I picked up a condensing unit. A condensing unit is um, when they have the condenser and the condenser fan outside and inside they have the air handling unit and they bring the refrigerant from the condenser into the air handling unit. Refrigerant, not water typically. I don't know if they do it with water or not. So it's like the compressor, it's like the chiller, but not really. They don't, they still use um, air to cool the system. It's still air, you can see here, they're throwing air here to cool the system. Condenser, air cooled. I don't know if you guys paid attention to that little one. Air cooled, not water cooled. Um, okay, so this particular one, like I said, when you have your evaporator inside the air handling unit, and you have your condenser and condenser uh, and compressor outside. So I thought um, here's a, um, a very, very important one, I think, as um, for condensing unit. This is typically from those manufacturer of this is called condensing unit, which is, has the compressor and the condenser outside the evaporator sitting somewhere inside the air handling unit. So I thought I pick one of you guys very important. So I want you guys to look. Here's my condenser. Here's my compressor inside it. Uh, compressor fans, of course. The compressor, when it comes to compressor, compressor fan. They have a full load amp for the compressor only. They have a rated load amp for the for the um, compressor fan and the compressor. See, these are directly related to them. But when you size, we, you, what you care about is this particular one. This is called the rated load amps. That's how you size the how much volt amp your unit, the compressor fan, the compressor as well as the condenser fan is going to suck out of your building. So you take this number, which is, um, let's just say I pick that one. This is a system is 480. I don't know if you guys can see that one. Care less about the rest of them. I care about this value. Right in here, this is a 460 um, or 480 system taking 40.8 amps out of the system. You multiply it by 480, multiply it by 1.73, you got yourself the allocated volt amp that you're going to add to your um, to your uh, service sizing calculation that we did way at the beginning, if you guys remember. So that's very, very important. That's the value that I personally, that we use, you should use for sizing the service, when you size your service. Then there is one value here. This is called minimum circuit ampicity. Very, very important. The manufacturers, because you can see there are multiple fan or multiple fans and a, a compressor all in one big box. The, the manufacturer guys size the, the ambicity for you and they give you something called minimum circuit ambicity. This one, this is how you size conductor. That's how you size your conductor based on this value uh, from the NEC code book. You size your conductor from minimum circuit ambicity done and that's the sheet that i gave you is related directly to this then the last thing is maximum fuse i want to emphasize the word fuse because they want you to do maximum fuse size so for this uh, unit i cannot go larger than a fuse only i don't know if they say maximum fuse equal maximum time delay or hacker circuit breaker it looks like they allow you to use a hacker circuit breaker right in here i don't know if you guys can see that for this unit um so that's my fuse as well as the conductor size so i have my um disconnect here my fuse in here um feeding this unit uh, this is my fuse size here and this is um where's my conductor size here's my conductor my oops my conductor size is right in here my conductor size any comments guys any questions so right on the nameplate they will give you the minimum circuit ambition maximum work and fiction device if they say the fuse you're supposed to put a fuse either next to the equipment or inside your um uh, your panel your mcc if you're using a circuit breaker panel obviously you can't put a fuse in it without uh, selling one of your arms and another leg so what you do is you put the fuse disconnect right next to the equipment any comments guys about these so that's um i thought that's a very important one and this is a 25, uh, it's an RC2544E, um, RC254, where is it? Somewhere here, I can't now read it. Um, so these are, this is, I picked these also, the information guys directly from the manufacturer. Here's a KW, I don't know if you guys can see, I know it's small for you, but it gives you the KW for these um, cooling units based on the catalog number that you can see over here. <clears throat> and that, yes, sir. Good point. 
you hold your horses for a second, it's coming. <laughs> Good point. I because that always bugged me too. What am I gonna say? The hacker. So we'll we'll get into the hacker. So, but if they told you they need a fuse, you're supposed to put a fuse. If they said a fuse or a hacker circuit breaker, you're supposed to have a fuse or a hacker circuit breaker. So that's based on the manufacturer. I don't know if you can see here that where it says hacker here and that um, maximum time delay fuse. And they use a lot of time delay fuses on these because of the starting capability. Okay, so that's I thought just to pick up a couple of uh, condenser. I picked these equipment guys because I thought it's very important um, for HVAC equipment. If the equipment has a compressor, hermetic compressor, um, then you apply the article 440. If the equipment does not have any type of compressor, like refrigeration equipment, if you guys do manufacturing, all refrigeration equipment, the same thing. We size them because they have a hermetic compressor. That type, that motor that's sealed together and cooled by the process of refrigeration, then you have to apply this one. Otherwise, otherwise you have to apply, like I said, the 430 to all the motors, the, um, and you have 424. 424 talks about heaters. If you have... Um, fixed uh, electric heaters like heating i don't know if they heat electricity like electrical boiler as in burning electricity not burning gas and controlling it with electricity and these are for appliances too if you have appliances it applies to it that's not for us a lot these are just for a smaller system so between 430 424 and 440 you get yourself covered for h back equipment h the heat will get you 424 um the ac will get you 440 and the heat um, uh, the heat will get you uh, 424. The um, AC will get you the 440 and um, um, V, which heating, uh, air conditioning, the uh, refrigeration, air conditioning, the ventilation, the V will get you the 430 because of ventilation system. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Just because it says a mechanical equipment doesn't mean you go always to 440. I, I used to conf be confused myself. Does it have a compressor in it or not? If it doesn't, it's a motor, either a motor or a heater, basically. Does that make sense? Go to the previous slide, yes, ma'am. Uh, RLA on the compressor, lock rotor, ah, oh, lock rotor amp. Um, good point. The lock rotor amp, we size the disconnect. I do have the sheets that I gave you guys. We use this one to size the disconnect. That's the major two, actually, two things. Number one, we size the disconnect for the compressor, um, as well as when we, um, when we do over competition coordination, the lock rotor current will decide um, are we going to be clearing the starting curve of this piece of equipment if it's going to be across the line, only if it's going to be across the line. So for sizing the disconnect as well as for coordination. Thank you. And I do have a, an example coming for you. Okay, so that's, um, so I threw these one guys that these are the terminology that they use. Here's that we just you just uh, started us at the right topic. Locked rotor current. You've seen it on the compressor, and um, compressor have a locked rotor current that will help you size over competition device for it through SKM, um, PTW, as well as size the disconnect um, for the equipment. You size the person disconnect. We have rated load amps. You guys have seen the rated load amps for the equipment right in here. Here's compressor. It's called rated load amps right here for the compressor. For rated load amps, um, this is or uh, rated or rated load current. Sometimes they call it. They define it, and I don't want to confuse anybody. They define it based on 64.1 percent of maximum continuous current. And you don't have to worry about this one. Maximum continuous current. The large since these are packaged, guys. The largest amount of current that the equipment can handle without breaking down is called maximum continuous current. And the rate, the rated load amps for these equipment for the compressor is based on 64% of what it could break at the back of this compressor. So they that makes sense. That they 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 under this condition, they see how much current can this compressor handle without breaking down. That's called maximum continuous um, cur um, continuous current. And then they rate the rated load amps at 64.1%. Doesn't play anything with what we size. 
Um, then there's minimum brand circuit selection current, minimum brand circuit selection current. The way I understand this one, if you don't have, um, you either have um, the unit rated load amps or or you have the uh, uh, minimum brand selection current, one of them, and you choose the largest. You choose the largest of the two in order to size the system. Um, so this will be the, the largest. This this is equivalent to the rated load amps or um, for the unit, if it's a unit, or for one equipment, if it's one equipment. The one I highlighted in red are the most important one, guys. Minimum circuit ambicity. Here's how this is on the nameplate. If it's not there, that's how they come up with it. They take 125% multiply it by the rated load amps that you're looking at the compressor or the minimum bright selection, selection current if the compressor is sharing other loads with it, as they always do. Um, and that's how they come up with the minimum circuit ambition. Maximum overcompetition device, um, that's also in the name plate like you've seen. They size it 100, 175% or 225% times the rated load amps for the compressor or the minimum brand circuit selection current, whichever is larger, whichever is larger. Um, the good news is we don't have to go that, that route because then you have to size it for the compressor and then there's a condenser fans you have to add to them and you get into all the sizes. So the manufacturer will stamp it with MOP. You see the MOP, you follow the MOP on the nameplate. But that's a couple of 175 is how you size it. It says, the NEC code book guy says, if it doesn't start, if you size it 175, it doesn't start, then allow you to go to 225. And in all times you go down. So if you end up with 175, it's not a standard overcompetition device. Are you supposed to go up to the next standard or down? You're gonna go down. The good news is again, these are already sized for you. These are already sized for you. Any comments guys about this terminology? Any comments about the terminology that they use with them? So, um, then I, I thought we'll oh, check the time here. Okay, doing good. Disconnect means, so we have the, all these terminology. The disconnect means when it comes to HVAC equipment, there are, there are basically three things you have to size for HVAC equipment, the, especially compressors. Com we're talking about compre anything that has compressor. You need an overcompetition device, which is given on the nameplate. You need a conductor size, which is also given on a name, the minimum circuit ambicity, and you need a disconnect with inside of the piece of equipment, which is you have to size that disconnect or it will be provided by the manufacturer. So these three things typically we do. And the four things we might, we might not do, which is provide the controller and the overload. And typically we don't. The control and the overload will be provided by the manufacturer as a VFD format and the overload will be built into this VFD. So that's three things. One of the one of the three things is what we call it the disconnect. Disconnect looks like like you, you guys have seen the disconnect. The the idea of the disconnect is completely utterly isolate the system so you can work on the mechanical contractor and the electrical contractor can safely work on the um, de-energized piece of equipment so they can their hands will come back with them. Um, how do they size it? Here's how they size 115 percent times the rated load amps, the rated load current or the brand circuit selection current. Um, so in terms of us now when if a rated load current for the equipment uh, or you take the unit you have the unit rated load amps for that unit the whole unit you multiply by one 1.15 and you put the next standard over temperature device for that particular unit um now not less than 115 of the sum of the current of all components one so if you have multiple components in one system you add them all together and you multiply them by 115. Add all the full load current to all the components, you multiply them by 115. So that's the size, the amp size. Then there's something called horsepower size. The horsepower size, if somebody is to go physically, mechanically, and, um, you know, and disconnect, um, shut down the air handling unit from the disconnect, unlike we typically, how do you shut the air handling unit? You push a button on a, your Johnson control system, shut it down. So if somebody's to go to grab the air handling unit and shut it down, right? That circuit, that disconnect is not going to blow up in your face. So it has to be horsepower. When it, when it comes to horsepower rated, it's power. It can handle the amount of power that goes through it in terms of turning it, interrupting it. So then you have to size it based on um, the locked rotor current equal to the rating that's coming from right in here amp wise. So it has to be horsepower rated um, to handle the amps. 
as um, full load amps as well as electrode or current amps. Full load amps as well as electrode or current amps. And I have a couple of examples for these. Um, over competition device, guys, we talked about this one not exceeding the value indicated in the name blade. That's directly, I just threw the, the references. So it is on the name blade, the maximum over competition device. Um, so it's marked, um, so it has to be marked, and this one will tell you that it has to be marked on the name blade, the short circuit current rating. Oh, this is interesting. The short circuit current rating of the controller have to be labeled on the control itself. So when Johnson controlled butcher VFD right onto um, the air handling unit, it's supposed to have a withstand rating. So if you have a short circuit, if you did your short circuit calculation, you can tell if this controller can withstand the amount of energy um, while it's being shaken and baked by the short circuit inside your equipment. So that's I thought that's really interesting. The controller have to be labeled with the withstand. A lot of a lot of controlling panels have to be for for a long time. Overload protection. You have to provide the overload protection. Um, from failure to start and manufacture. Typically, the manufacturer provide this one overload as part of their control system. Because remember, guys, with the uh, with the chillers, there are multiple things um, with the cooling system. So you have a compressor and you have the fans. So the compressor is going to have its own overload, and the fans are going to be having their own overload because the overload is specific for the for that particular equipment. So that will be left to the manufacturer to size them right inside the um, equipment. Any comments, guys, about the overcompetition device, the overload, the controller, and the disconnect for these? And I do have an example there in the disconnect. Yeah. Okay. You, uh, you know the yes. So. Technically, when you're going to do the, so they have the unit rated load amps. In this case, we have a compressor, rated load amps compressor, and we have a condenser fan. So you're going to take this amp, let's just say this unit, and let's just say we're parenting it at this unit amp. These two amps, you're going to add them up together. So that will get you the full load current of the fan as well as the compressor. Then you're going to multiply them by the 1.7, 1.7, 1.15. So that's you're going to size. Um, that will size because I know this unit has only one fan and only um, one compressor. Now, if I don't have these values, what am I going to do? See, I don't. I have these values right here, but I don't have them. All I have is rated load amps for the unit. I use the rated load amps for the unit, which is in this case would be that one. If you don't have these values with you, the easier way is here's that value. You use the same where are we here and this this value here, rated load amps and multiply it by one point um, uh, one point one five and you size um, the disconnect for your unit. But if you do have the compressor and the condenser fan full load amps like you do, because it's going to be you're going to be disconnecting both of them simultaneously. So you add the full load amp, multiply it by 1.5. That will be that. That will be the amp size of your disconnect. Now the horsepower size of your disconnect, you're going to add them up together, the two amps. You're going to go to the NDC article 430, 250, the table, the horsepower table, and say you came up with 100 amps, 100 amp equivalent to, say 100 horsepower. It's going to be 100 horsepower based on the full load amp. Then you're going to go also the lock trotter current. So I have a lock, then then you have to size it based on the lock trotter current. Here's my lock trotter current for this guy. Now this guy has no lock trotter current because it's a baby. So what I, if you don't have it, um, you take and you multiply by um, by six. That's the assumption. The lock trotter current will be equivalent to the starting current. So you multiply by six and you add these two values together and then you size then you size your disconnect horsepower to handle the um the lock trotter current so it might it might give you a bigger horsepower rating so okay i know it's a little bit <laughs> the sheets the sheets makes it a little bit simpler though they have okay so we got these got these here's a couple of i thought a couple of name blades guys um rated load amps that's your um rated load amps locked rotor this is a compressor equipment this is directly for the compressor here's my locked rotor current for this particular compressor 
you can see um, and then uh, condenser. I have a condenser full load amps. Look at my condenser here, my evaporator. These are the fans for the condenser evaporator right in here. And then um, I, ha I have a heat, also a, a heat uh, strip over here that you have to add to. So all this stuff, you can summarize it with minimum circuit selection current of this amount, depending which voltage you're using. Let's use uh, 208 because we're in the 208 world. And um, the fuse will be 60 amps as well as the hacker or circuit breaker. Uh, fuse or hacker circuit breaker will be 60 amps. So the minimum branch circuit selection current, 51.4 amps. That's the value that you're going to be using to select your, um, your conductors, to select your conductors. In this case, it's the minimum circuit ambicity, equivalent to the minimum circuit ambicity. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, questions? Now, if you want to size the disconnect, you have to take the lock rotor current and add the lock rotor current of these three motors to it. Um, hacker installation uh, disconnects. So we have, um, this is just, a, I thought a couple of example guys, how to size them, the fans, all the, all the stuff that we did is right in here in, t in terms of um, the fuse size. Let me just move this one. The branch circuit size, the disconnect size, the conductor size, all the stuff that we did, the label, the label that you have to have on your equipment, overload is set by your your manufacturers of these equipment. Um, so I thought uh, a good example summarizing it too. Okay, hackers versus circuit breakers. Hackers for cir circuit breakers. I pulled this one from Cutler Hammer. I don't know if you've seen it. Who asked about the hackers? Um, long story short, based on UL489, all circuit breakers are rated to handle HVAC equipment. That's what Cutler Hammer and I, Square D, the same thing they see. All circuit breakers are rated. In the past, they used to be tested to handle uh, circuit breaker, to handle um, um, HVAC equipment conversers. They discovered the two tests that they do are equivalent. So a circuit breaker can handle compressor hermetic motors as good as a fuse. So if you meet 480, uh, UL 489, you basically in default, you meet the requirement for the hacker. Having said so from that document from Color Hammer, they say certain customers still require to have a hacker label on the circuit breaker if they are used with um, uh, with compressors and chillers. So it, unless it's required, the manufacturer assume all circuit breakers will meet the hacker requirement. So they don't label them unless you require it. That's what Color Hammer, what's your experience, David, with that one or anybody? So that's kind of the, or you use fuses or? Uh, we, we always use HAC breakers if it's a piece of HVAC equipment. So that's what the, I mean, it will be, in, I, I'll forward this one from Color Hammer directly from their website. And, and I went to Square D the same thing because it bothered me for a while. They say they, uh, if they all meet for you, uh, 489 UL, it meets the hacker requirement. Though, because the NEC code book keeps talking about the hacker hacker, certain customers like to see that hacker on the circuit breaker. So they will label it for you if you request it. Any comments, guys, about the whole hacker? So I threw a couple of examples here um, um, that these are directly from, from Cutler Hammer, the hacker rated motor case circuit breakers, and they still have them, but, and I threw this one right next to it to say you meet the, all of them meet the hacker. Unless end user still require the marking. Cool. So if you guys still require the marking, you provide the marking. Okay, mo moved on into the ch couple of chillers, guys. Um, yeah. Yes, what? Yes. Yes. Yes, you don't. You don't. Yeah. None? The fuses. Yes. Yes. The diffuses. No. No. So the good point. But what happened if when, when it comes to disconnect, there are two types of disconnect. Fuseless disconnect, 
and fuse disconnect. The fuse inside disconnect and one fuses. If you're to put a, a fuse in a disconnect, then your sizing will all get screwed up. And you will see, just to give you an idea, if you want to size this fuse, the way we size this fuse, this, you might end up with a 60 amp fuse and based on the NDC code book, a 30 amp disconnect. So either you have to have a fuse holder that right underneath it to fit the 60 amp fuse, or if you want to put a 60 amp fuse in a fuse holder, uh, a packaged fuse holder with a disconnect, it, the disconnect had to be rated for 60. So you might have, my point is you might have to up your disconnect because if you're using a fuse inside it, um, based on the size of your fuse. If you're using a fuse inside it. Okay, so these are a couple of chillers that I thought they're re really interesting from Tran and you guys deal with all the time. These are water-cooled chillers. And what I thought interesting is these are the sizes in tons here. And I use them, the sheet, the, the cheat sheet that you guys have, they're taken directly from um, from here. The chillers are taken from, from these sheets. And it will give you the arrangement, uh, the mechanical information about them, the compressor and the condenser and the so forth. I thought this is interesting. What interests me is the electrical part. The second part, guys, here's a 40 ton um, chiller and i have an input electrical input looks like we have uh, uh 73.8 at temperature of 75 that's is that what you were saying uh um about different different rating at different temperature water coming into it i don't know if you guys can see here's a um at this value here's my input and at this value here is my other input so it will have different values yeah. at different temperature. So you choose the largest value and you size your equipment based on that. Uh, yeah, for my experience, because of that cooling effect, uh, every manufacturer has the same cooling effect. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But typically, that's why we go by the name blade most right. of the time. But, yeah, but this is about the performance of the equipment. If you have a 40 uh, ton chiller at whatever, to look at the three temperature will give you three different outputs coming out of um, the higher the temperature coming into the unit that you need to chill, the more juice you need to cook um, to, to chill this water. And then here's my uh, the value that you use. Can you guys see that one? This is a kilowatt ton. Have you ever What's your value when they say 500 ton chiller? How many kilowatt is the 500 ton, ton chiller? Well, in this case, <laughs> yeah, one to one and certain, yeah, one to one, certain manufacturers will have you, if you look at, you'll go down on these, it goes lower than one even, the ratio between kilowatt to ton. Um, so that's uh, based on the equipment. So it gives you the kilowatt to ton ratio. Uh, any comments, guys, about these? I thought a different temperature give you different uses. Obviously, you're going to choose the largest um, that you can for in terms of sizing. Okay, then we get into the electrical, same thing, electrical data. This is really interesting because the same, this is, by the way, the same, uh, this is 40, um, the same chiller, same chiller manufacturer, electrical data. Here's my um, chiller, water cooling chiller. And if I am to use, I, and, and I use these one for you guys, I'm going to use for this unit here, 460. And I have a, a number of connection power. I'm bringing one power to it. The minimum circuit ambicity for this baby is minimum circuit ambicity for the unit. They're going to size the circuit for it is here. Maximum overcome texture device for this baby is here. Rated load amps. Uh, looks like it's rated load amps for the unit is here as well as these are interesting now this is for um if you are starting your motor away the lock torture current will be 114 if you start your motor across the line which is a delta your lock torture current will be 374 six very interesting so that's why most of chillers what they do at least they have a y delta start they start them as a y chop down the starting current into 114 and then then plug that delta, reconfigure them into a delta, and uh, and get the full oomph out of this chiller. The delta is it gives you a lot of torque. So I thought this is really interesting, directly from the manufacturer, right underneath it for the same equipment, and they, you can bring two uh, feeds to the building. 
two connections to the same chiller and look at that now they split the load between them i don't know if you guys can see that and they have two fuses have you guys encountered that where a chiller have two sizes coming on it gets bigger they want smaller yeah you said you you do this for them they have mul multiple feeders coming to the same chill. So, smaller circuit breakers, smaller conductors, smaller conduits. I don't know. Is there any other reason that mechanical reason? Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. But if you look at um, this one, uh, if like 125 amp circuit breaker it might not coordinate with others, other things above screen, it's bigger circuit breaker. If you flip the if you cut them into two, it might do better coordination if it's better in your panel. That's the only thing I can think of. Because these are smaller loads. We can carry them with them. But it cuts the amps, the circuit breaker size, inside your panel as well as the overcompetition device. Um, so if you have a short circuit, you can shut down part of the, the system. I don't know if it has to do with the operation of it. Too. Yeah, the multiple feeds. The, any comments? So that's for a chiller. The one that I showed you guys before was for a condensing unit, which is uh, the compressor and the condenser. This one is the chiller. So we have the evaporator, the condenser, and everything all in one. The, con the evaporator, the condenser, and, um, and the compressor. Any comments about these chillers and tons? Comments? So that's um, the second one, guys. I Same chiller, same unit, and these are from Tran. The same 80 ton, um, they have an information um, about the wiring system. So they will give you how many connections you can. Here's the same chiller that we were talking about right in here a minute ago. Here's my size um, connection, the size that they size for. And here, how many conductors, the size of the conductor that you can land on. Um, wire delta range if you have wire selection non fuse disconnect and wire selection circuit breaker disconnect so they give you the selection um it looks like ranges and sizes that's so this is size of disconnect that you use if it's non fuse this is size of disconnect um, that you use um, if it's circuit breaker and this a largest for size any comments, guys? Any questions about this? I don't see it as valuable. I don't know if you guys, this is more valuable, that sheet, but I thought it's really interesting, the information, the ranges that they give it to you. Comments, questions about that? Back to what you said. So then I grabbed a couple of sheets here for you, the same unit that we were looking at from Tram. Here's a double feed. I don't know if you guys can see. Here's where they bring double feed to the system. I'm feeding this piece of equipment. That's um, that's your 80 ton chiller or 500 ton chiller. You're bringing two feeds to it. Everything else is internal, and all these are the ins and outs of the equipment, the the control. You can see the schematics gets really really interesting. But I thought just to focus on the two units because it, uh, I think it bugged me too. The two feeds coming into the units right in here. Fuse disconnect right next to them or disconnect only with the circuit breaker in the panels um more of the connection this is what you're looking at these two pages are the schematics for this particular chiller so you can see how many inputs now these the rest of them is just input points to control this uh, this beast um chiller water diagrams i thought just to give a couple of um examples about chiller but this is my favorite this one gives you the actual and i know you guys are mechanical so i just throw them for reference these will give you the, how i mean um, if you are to put your electrical which we don't if you have to put your mechanical pa electrical panels inside the room that has also a chiller so you need the clearances this will give you clearances around mechanical equipment that they need so you can for us who cares we can, i mean we we have it for our generators our uh, our panels but give you the clearances around the equipment so i can situate my um electrical equipment accordingly in this area so all these if you look at these numbers right underneath it they give you the number with the evaporator water inlet they identify it and they give you depending which which one you're looking at for example um and now i can't i barely can read them they, they identify the places and they also give you distances let's say here the distance right in here h i don't know if you guys can see that one h if you come to h here 
it will give you the clearances that distance have to be in both millimeters um, as well as inches. So at um, a standard efficiency, and these the top are the chillers that apply to. So here's my 80 chiller, 80 ton chiller. Um, so that will give you the high efficiency and standard efficiency and the clearances that you have to maintain around these equipment. I, it becomes a big deal, guys, for the electrical, um, the mechanical guys, but I thought just to throw this one for you. Yes. Well, what this comes, what this, um, the way I would think of it, say if I want to put a switch, electrical switch gear right in here, right? right. And now I need, I need my four, let's just say three to four clearances right in here. So that might be a consideration for us if we are to put our electrical equipment into the mechanical room to pay attention to the clearances that they need around the electrical equipment. I'm sure there will be a lot of... Uh, discussion with the mechanical engineers too. But that would be, electrically speaking, we only care about electrical equipment and typically four feet, three to four, depending on the voltage, but 480, um, hot from both sides, it's four feet. So you clear four feet for yourself, you're good. I thought what it's really nice to know, since we deal with them all the time, is that they have a clearances around them like we do with our electrical equipment. That was really my, my concern. Yeah. So clearances um, for connection and so forth. Okay, so electrical, then I went into electrical boiler. Now we, this is the chiller basically for you. All the th thing that you need to do about chiller. I thought since we talk about heating ventilation, let's talk about electrical chiller. Here's article 440 talks about electrical chillers. When we size electrical chillers, we size the over temperature device, the brand circuit and the disconnect based on a magic number that's called 125 times the full load amps. And I mean by boiler here, a boiler here is an electrical boiler, electrical electricity burning boiler, meaning not gas boiler powered with a control 20 amp circuit control for it. These are your burning electricity to, to boil it. So here's um, an example of this one. I have uh, this baby typically, um, so I have a two runs of, um, I don't know what the over temperature device is. My over temperature device coming in here. I could have an 800 amp feeder coming into that boiler. Do you guys do a lot of uh, electric boiler, burning electricity? Not a whole lot. But if you were to use, here's an 800 amp feeder um, coming to the boiler. That's where you can split them into two 400s coming into that, that system. Um, fit via two sets of uh, per phase. I don't know if you can see that one. It's a two sets per phase, uh, 500 kcm, to feed this piece of equipment. The over temperature device will be an 800 amp. 500, two sets of 500 uh, lined in every freezer, and the disconnect, your disconnect is going to be rated for an 800 amp disconnect, or or it's going to be the circuit breaker itself can act as your disconnect. Any comments, guys? So when it comes to heaters, really very easy. Everything is continuous load 1.25. Circuit breaker, conductor, as well as a disconnect. You require a disconnect, you require a conductor, and you require an over temperature device. And I thought um, a couple of things, this is just a control circuit of that one. Here's typically, here's what we deal with. We deal with a 20 amp circuit that you guys allocate to the, to the gas or oil burner that you have, 20 amp control circuit. Do you allocate more than 20 amps typically? 20 amps is typical, that's for your control. That's what you deal with, that's just for the control. That circuit here is for the power if needed. If you don't have electrical power, obviously this does not exist. Same thing, high limit control, boiler temperature control, and low water cutoff, uh, cutout, and outside heat uh, sensor. So that's when it, you know, you can start your boiler at a certain temperature outside and know what the temperature that they use to start their boiler outside, if the temperature outside. And then they have, if you have no water to boil, instead of boiling your water, you're burning your water, your boiler, you shut off. And there's a couple of, all these are control devices what we call them a class one control circuit to control that process. But the power part of it is really easy, 1.25 to size everything. Any question guys about the heat? That's the heat in the HVAC uh, system, the heat in your HVAC system. 
Here's a good example of, um, like I said, that particular heater disconnect. I thought I threw this one directly for you. It's an electric furnace. I want to bring to your attention, guys, to always when you have heat and cool, you're dealing with a class two circuit, and class two circuit is always an article 447 uh, 25. And all the stuff that we just talked about from the nameplate directly is sized right in here. So in this case, I have 100 amp uh, fuse, disconnect, and conductor. Can you guys see that? I have a conductor, a fused disconnect, and a conductor that feed this electric furnace. Um, and the disconnect will be within sight of it, act as, uh, as you disconnect as well as conductor overload. Any comments? Uh, bring to your attention that all this information is going to be in the nameplate for the heater. And then let's show the name, the voltage, the amps. You need the amps, um, the watts. So if you get the watts or the amps, these are resistive loads. If they give you the watts, you can find the amps easily. So it's not a big deal because the resistive load the power factor is uh, a one. Any comments, guys, about he resistive heat? Resistive heat by resistive heat. Okay, and this is just a couple of examples, guys, how these are for circulating pumps. Remember these circulating pumps for the heating cooling? You're going to have a cool, cool water, chilled water circulating pumps, hot water circulating pumps, condenser circulating pumps. All these pumps could be, this is one way of wiring them. Uh, we did all this, guys, last week, if you remember, you sized that disconnect based on 1.15, the work competition device 2.5, 2.5 2, 2 if it's circuit breaker, 1.75 if it's a fuse maximum. And the relays, and these are a couple of thermostats. What I want to bring to your attention is these here. This is, um, in this case, thermostat class two circuit that we also have to pay attention who's going to be piping these systems. Because the power, we know that we have to care about the power. These are your thermostat that you need to pay attention to who's providing them, who's piping them um, to control these pumps, to control these pumps based on the temperature of the, you know, the hot and the cold water. Any comments, guys, questions about the pumps, pumps control? This is one way of doing it. One way of doing it. And the last thing is, since everything, we talked about the power circuit. It's, I thought it's really nice to talk about class two circuits. I'm sure you guys, class two and class three circuit. These are control and signaling circuits. For you guys, you don't, do you guys do security systems? If you do security, you do. So security system will be also a class two circuit. Um, the way I understand anybody, you guys deal with class two, class three, class, you start with a class two circuit. If you ran out of voltage because the distance is so far, because class two, cir uh, two circuits limited the voltage, you can go 300 volt on a class three circuit. So if you have a sensor on the end of the um, 300 feet run, you want to go pick it up, you can use a class three circuit, go up to a higher voltage. That's how I understand it. Higher voltage class three circuit give you a higher voltage, not a whole lot of amps though. Higher voltage, very limited amount of amps, just distance, voltage drop distance. But for the most part, you use class two circuits. Um, with class two circuit, there's labels that you have to be aware of. CLT, the cables will be class two circuit. CLT, three is CL3. P stands for plenum, riser, and X for limited use. You guys don't use X. So when you see all these as, I don't know how, how involved you get into the control of it. Um, you know, but you have to be aware that they, these to meet the code, all these cables have to be labeled appropriately. And these are very common knowledge. I mean, it's not like um, secrets. And here's my control circuit. Like we said, they cannot enter the same box. I don't know if you can see here. You can't put them in the same box or the same uh, conduits because they're controlled. They're not, they're insulated differently. And here's um, uh, my class two circuit thermostat for this uh, circulating pump. And um, and then I have a class one circuit. I didn't mention a class one circuit. So class two and three are control circuit for and signaling circuit. Class one circuit tend to be a high voltage, high power control and or safety circuit. Um, so class one circuit can be as high as you want it to be. So if you have a, um, a 500 horsepower motor and you need to control it remotely, um, you can take a 600 volt control circuit, class one, no limitation of power, and control that magnetic starter or VFD that go into a 500 horsepower motor. And they tend to be more um, safety circuits, still control, safety, no limitation power, no limitation on um, on voltage. You can go as high as 600 volt on class one circuit. So that's, um, that's it in terms of these. Any comments, guys, questions? I hope it wasn't... Uh, 
I did mislead you too much on the disregard on the HVAC equipment. Any comments? I have uh, 20 minutes to walk you through the rest of these. Um, so let me start, guys, by taking you to um, coordination. I'm going to go to the but, first. Uh, yeah. Jed, before you do that, can you go back to this uh, okay. slide that had the air conditioning and refrigeration equipment with locked rotor ramps, maximum continuous current air conditioning? Okay. Let me go, 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 go back. Yeah, back, 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 back. I see. There you go. There you go. So when you were circling stuff, I think there was an opportunity for confusion. Okay. Lock rotor amps, when he said you multiply something by six, you circle LR8 again. If they don't give you lock rotor amps, you can estimate it by multiplying the rated load amps by six. Absolutely. It's not given. If you circle lock rotor amps and said multiply by six. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I meant. Lock rotor amps. No, lock rotor amps is if it's given. My apology. In the yeah. rated load amps, if their cut sheet is correct, it should add up. The rated load amps of, the, of that piece of equipment off that cut sheet should be the sum of the rated load amps of each individual piece of part of it. It's, it's not on that cut sheet. That happens all the time because yeah. there could be, uh, this might just be your compressors and condensers. There might also be a cooling fan for the unit that's not necessarily a condenser fan. It's a separate fan, and there can also be like a heat <laughs> in there. So, but the rated load amps of your condensing unit should add up, should be the sum of the compressor rated load amps and the condenser yeah. Yeah. amps, unless there's something else in it. The other one in there is the, you said the minimum branch circuit selection current was equivalent to the rated load amps, but it's really equivalent to the minimum circuit capacity, right? The, the way, the way I understand, if you have multiple things inside the units, they take the rated load amps of each one of these equipments, and the, the minimum circuit ambition it's calculated by taking the rated load amps of the compressor, multiplied by 1.25, plus the full load current of the fans with the compressors and the heaters and everything else, and that will get you the minimum circuit ambition. Cool. Now, the branch circuit selection current, the way I understand it, and I could be wrong, is it's like rated load amps, except they make the equipment, either the equipment will have other things with it, or they make it work harder to get you a different current. So if you have the rated load amps and the minimum, minimum brand circuit selection current, you are supposed to choose one of them when you do your calculation. But the minimum circuit ambicity is different though, is you take the largest of the two and you multiply it by 1.25. Yeah, I guess I have the maximum yeah. minimum brand circuit selection current. Yeah. Minimum so, circuit ambicity should be 125% of the largest power plus, plus all, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's either or, and I, I, I'm struggling with it myself, is why, they, what, what I read about it is you can give you the rated load amps or minimum minimum uh, circuit um, selection current, and you choose, or minimum brand circuit selection current, and you choose the, the largest of the two when you do your sizes. But having said that, you really don't need to do even go there because the maximum overcompetition device and the minimum circuit ambition is already sized for you for these pieces of equipment. It becomes an issue when you size a disconnect. When you size a disconnect, if when you size your disconnect, you need the rated load amps for the unit. If you have the rated load amps for the unit, that's all what you need to size your disconnect. Done. Like in this case, uh, where is my uh, rated load amps for my disconnect? I, I use my rated my rated load amps for my disconnect right here. Any of these. Um, multiply by 1.15, and I got myself a disconnect size. That's only because the minimum circuit ambition is there, uh, maximum uh, overcompetition device is also there. So the other comment I want to make is that often we are, we get a cut sheet that only has the minimum circuit capacity and maximum overcurrent protective device, and they don't give us rated load current. So if you have a big piece of equipment, <clears throat> that 125% of whatever the largest motor in there plus the sum of all the rest, that extra 25% can cause you to oversize your service and oversize the feeders, motor control centers and everything else. So if it's a small 
rough dock unit or something, maybe not a big deal, but if it's a huge 200 ton uh, rough top mounted uh, HVAC system, march over to the mechanical department and say, get your rep to cough up the FLA, RLA, so I can figure out what yeah. the service size really is, so I don't throw in an extra 25 or some percent of something huge. Yeah. And I've been successful with that in the past, but you have to follow that and say, we need the rest of the information. Because yeah. the country doesn't give it all. It's just, so don't, again, if it's small, it might not make any difference, but if it's a big yeah. unit, it can make a huge difference. I've had to reverse engineer it out of the MCA, and if it came out exact, then I was happy, and if it didn't come out exact, I was still not happy, and I still told them they had to come up with a number from the rep. Yeah. What I, what I found, if you have a catalog number for your mechanical counterparts, plug that one, you know what the manufacturer is, all the catalog numbers are there. All the electrical information they're looking for is right in there. So, I mean, look at this one, like RTW D80. It can give you the rated load amp, maximum current, lock structure current, all the information. So, but it's not saying it. Some, some manufacturers, it's not that easy. Oh, uh, yeah. It depends on the manufacturer. Do the trend. Yeah. Okay. So, that's, um, let me, uh, we have only. <laughs> Okay, let's just jump directly into one of these. I'm going to use a chiller. So I have TCC, two CCs. So what I thought, guys, um, so I did coordination for my chiller. And um, you can see my, my chiller here. Let me go to larger here. I have a chiller. My starting curve on this chiller, I decided to use the same chiller that we I showed you. I decided to use a Y delta start on it, not a VFD. If you have a VFD, you have no problem with the start. So I don't know if you guys can see that curve, that start, the green is a starting curve right in here is when I switch, when I switch from Y into a delta, it kicks. It has a little kick here. That's how the um, ECD, um, uh, SK, SKM PTW can do the starting curve on it. So I have my overload, I threw an over uh, the few, first I use the circuit breaker, a fuse here, and then I also have right underneath it, I don't know if you guys can see a circuit breaker, so I use the circuit breaker and a fuse um, just to show you the coordination. When you coordinate, just to give you a quill, and this is my circuit breaker damage curve, so you can see I'm protecting my circuit, my, my um, branch circuit from damage, I'm starting my chiller, I have an overload protection that I picked, which it could be the same or not. And I have a fuse. Um, here's the size of my fuse for this chiller and the size of my overcome protection device. What I want to tell you guys is when um, when I size these, the size, when you size them based on 1.75 and you go do SKM analysis on them, you can end up sizing them. You can easily size them at 100% if you want to. And if you have an adjustable circuit breaker or, uh, or uh, um, a dual element time delay fuse, you can do a great, a great sizing and great coordination with only 1.25, even though Remember, you are allowed to use the maximum overcompetition device from the manufacturer. You have to use it, but you can use less than the maximum overcompetition device from the manufacturer if you do analysis on this. So, so that's um, and I believe this particular one, I think it was 225 amp, and I was able to use 200 amp and coordinate properly between the circuit breaker and the starting curve of this motor. So that's what I thought is. Well, if you have SKM, which you guys, most of you have, and you know how to use it, you can go check your work and you can go for lower, lower than what what they ask you to do. Why lower? More, better protection at all times. Every time your circuit breaker is lower, you have a better protection for your, your system. So that's um, that this one, uh, because of the time, if I have a, a I, um, I'm going to take you guys into my chiller. So you have these sheets. What I did for these sheets, I thought just put everything together. So I thought I have a system where I have three chillers and I need to have the branch circuit, the overload, the controller, the overcompetition device, the disconnect, the feeder, and the feeder overcompetition device and a feeder disconnect if any. 
and size all these based on any secret book. These chillers are directly from Tran based on the ones that I showed you guys. I picked them directly from their catalog number. I have the voltages for them, the rated load amps directly from these units, maximum overcome protection device, maximum uh, uh, minimum city, um, minimum circuit and busy lock torture current for each one of these chillers is there based on the Y. When I pick these for again, these are directly from the sheet that you guys have. I picked the Y because I decided to use a Y delta start on this motor. You could have used a BFD and 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 you don't even worry about the start. So I have a Y delta start on it. It's an 80 ton, 90 and 110, all of them. Cool. So everybody knows that what's the given. Now the calculation right in here. The first one is finding the full load current. Full load current is given or rated load amps right in here. And 440.4, guys, I have the references for you. It tells you where does it say that you it has to be on the nameplate. Cool. And then um, lock rotor amps is given right underneath it. Direct, basically, I copied them directly from, um, from right in here. And then I went to the brand circuit conductor. The brand circuit conductor, I did calculation. But before I do the calculation, I the bolded, is it bolded in US? It should be bolded, right? The bolded one is what you should go by. The minimum circuit ambassador for chiller number one is 94. Right in here, I must use 94. 96 for the second one and 120 for the third one. That's what I must use. Now, if I don't have these values, here's what I could have done. You take the 1.25 times it by the rated load amps, it gives you 100, 102. Look at that. From 102, they allow me to size it to 94. That's that's okay because the manufacturer said you can do that. So I did the calculation at the top. That top calculation, just FYI, um, if you don't have the minimum circuit ambassador, that's what you're going to be doing. Any comments, guys? Is it confusing? I thought just to leave the calculation there, that's what the code says, but they always give it to you anyway on the nameplate. If you don't have it and you want to estimate, if you can see most of them, all of them are larger than what the minimum circuit ambassador anyway. So if you use it, you will be just oversizing system a little bit. So that's your minimum circuit ambassador for this chiller. Um, equipment grounding conductor, this is brand circuit equipment ground conductor, EMT, FMC, I did my best not to make mistakes in sizing the conduit, so if you guys find any size conduit wrong here, let me know. Um, overload, here's what I did the overload, if you guys go to, uh, for the overload, 440.52A will tell you, when you size your overload, you can go as high as 140. And I always wondered, why the heck do they allow it to use 140? I want to remind you guys, these are, they have refrigeration cycle going right through the motor, so it cools it down, so you can overload that baby, and because it's being cooled down, that's the way I, I justify 140, versus overload for motors that doesn't have a refrigeration cycle in it is 1.15 or 1.25, that's as high as you can get. So anyway, but having said that, oh, okay. To allow it to, to yeah, to allow it to go. Pull, okay. For the start, okay. I don't. I really. I. That's what I said when uh, we don't use it. Do you guys size them? Typically, I said manufacturer, manufacturer, right in there. So I. That's. I just threw this one FYI only, but typically I highlighted the manufacturer, though I wouldn't go by this size. I would go by the manufacturer. Then I have my controller. My controller, when you size the controller, you size it, if you guys go to 440.41, it tells you rated load amps and lock torture current. You have to size it based on rated load amps and lock torture current and voltage. What's the voltage of the controller? What's the full load amp or rated load amps? And what's the lock torture current? It has to be able to handle all this. And I just lift it this way because that would be VFD or magnetic starter and so forth. Um, overcome protection device, you multiply it by 1.75. I came up with 143.5. So that should have dropped me down to 143, 125. There's no more than 125, right? 125 um, in this case. And the maximum overcome protection device is given as 125 from the nameplate. So I don't have to worry about that. Same thing for, I have a, um, 
I have um, not the disconnect. Where's my? I have 168 here. I dropped me down to 150, and on 210 I dropped down um, to 200. And actually, I dropped down because um, because of the maximum of competition advice is already given to me. So I don't really have to do the calculation. Am I clear, guys, about that? You don't have to do the calculation. I just did them there above to see how they came up. They happen to match here because you have to drop down. Um, but that's where you get these. Disconnects, his 115 times rated load amps, and you go to the next standard disconnect, which is 60, 100, multiple hundreds. I have my disconnects. Um, then um, my branch circuit equipment ground and conductor, I jumped over these intentionally at the beginning. You size them, of course, you have to know the fuse size to size these. So this is sized number six based on 125 amp a fuse. And then um, then we get into the conduits here, all the conduit sizing. We're, we're pulling three conductors and an equipment ground conductor in an EMP conduit for the branch circuit and a flex just to go from the disconnect to the equipment. Then I have my feeder. My feeder, very easy, exactly like motors, guys. It says take the largest, fattest chiller in the system, multiply it by 1.25, add the full load current to the rest of them, and size your cables. Equipment ground conductor is sized based on overcompetition device. Skip that one. Um, EMT is, is straightforward. You take that three, number 400, and the equipment ground conductor and find yourself a conduit two and a half. Then here's the interesting one. The overcompetition device for the whole system, exactly like motors, they take the largest fuse in the three of them, add the full load current to all of the, the other two full load current, give you a number, and then go to the next standard down, which is 350. So that's the fuse for the system is 350. Now the disconnect, this one is optional. I don't know if anybody will ever do that. I can't emphasize you don't need this one, the disconnect for the whole system. Um, um, but if you are to use a disconnect for the whole system, here's what you do. You add them all up, multiply them by 115, get you this number, and then you go to the next standard. And I so you guys uh, don't think I brought these from my basement. I just listed all the references uh, on the side. And um, the feeder, then for feeder disconnect, you also have to have a feeder amp-wise. For feeders, you have two sizes, amp and horsepower. For horsepower, they size them based on the full load amp and also based on the lock trotter current. That's where the lock trotter current becomes a big deal. So I have all my lock trotter current added up. Then you can go to table um, um, 430.251B, and you cross-reference this one. It gives you 125. So the full load amp for the three chillers give me a 250 horsepower equivalent. The lock trotter current gave me 125. Then you have to choose the largest. So my disconnect, if I am to use a disconnect, to disconnect the whole three chillers at the same time, it has to be rated for 250 based on these. Any comments, guys? Any questions about this? Yes, sir. Mm. Okay, so the... Did, did you do the calculation? Where, uh, not Taibo, but when I did the calc. So here's 120, 120 here. Oh, here's 124 here. Oh, the overload. I see. Okay, now it's going to be right. Is it right now? Correct. That's the only one, 124. All the way down, yeah, 124. Okay, can you guys add one? Thank you. So I just, I, I don't know, 124. Yeah, it must be the math must be on 120. Okay, can you guys correct that one? Thank you. As so I said, check, check. Here's, these are why I did 124. Okay, here's 124. Thank you. That's what. Uh, all right. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, questions about that? Thank you. So that's kind of uh, the. Thing. I have one minute to get you. And the other one, guys, is identical, the same thing. Um, this is for cooling units. I did the same cooling units from the cut sheet that I gave you guys, and I ran some calculation. And now, by now, you have to test my uh, my calculation before we go there. Um, the last thing I want to show is um, um, this one is, you guys are very familiar with, of course, the uh, mechanical schedule. I thought... 
where can I move this way? Okay, here's mechanical schedule. Is it hard? <laughs> so here's um. Is it is it big or you can blow it up with the blue text? Uh, sorry guys, but but I thought this is the least of your problem because you guys have this, right? You do it all the time. So I did the. I, there's a couple of this is from project that we do at Dunwoody. So I have um, a couple of horsepowers, of course, uh, voltages, the full load amp from the NDC code book, disconnect, and all size appropriately. Um, and that's basically what you need to do. I don't know what you guys do with the starter. Here's your starter type, starter by starter size. And the control, we leave it for uh, division 23. Control, location, care less. Um, that's mechanical counterpart. Conduit size, as well as the frame uh, circuit breaker, um, as well as the panel that's going to be feeding it, and the size of the circuit breaker that's going to be feeding these equipment. So do you guys have your schedule? Have anything that's not on this, typically? Do you have, uh, I thought, just to show. So what we typically do, like you all know, we go talk to the mechanical um, engineers, and we get the information, the electrical information about the mechanical equipment, plug them into our schedule. Do you add one schedule for mechanical electrical? Dave here, or each has their own schedules? We have a schedule on our sheet. It has, you know, it's not the same schedule. But it has the they same. They don't put electrical information on their mechanical schedule on their sheets. So they're referring. We don't put mechanical information on our electrical schedule. Okay. So anything electrical, we'll say, like in, in this one here, um, control, since we don't do control whatsoever, uh, control by division yeah, 23. Have, so if, it, you know. if they're controlling it, we have. By them, and if we have, if it's just a toggle switch or something, we're you know for the battery fan, then we put by 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 division twenty six, and then whatever it is. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Ultimately, all what we did is to come up with this schedule. <laughs> so, any questions, guys? Any comments? I hope I did not mislead you a lot. There's a lot of numbers and crunching. Thank you for correcting me, guys. That's all I have. Next week, we're going to do transformers and capacitive transformers. Do a couple of transformers and tabs and so forth. Thank you. Okay, hey, Santa Clarita, make sure you take attendance and make sure you put your time on the appropriate uh, training.